everybody. My name is Max. I'm Max, also known as Morcro. Today, I'm doing a different video. Like all the other videos, I try to do something completely different, if not at least change the theme of every single video I make. I'm going to be talking about drugs. Not a joke. I'm going to be talking about neurotransmitters. I will not be talking nonsense. And instead, we'll be talking based on facts and a psychology class I attend to. As well as talk from my point of view and other opinions. This video is thanks to my psychology professor. I will not disclose any information about my college or professor, but I want to lecture on behalf of her and the compiled research that made the current state of psychology possible. Disclaimer, I am not a licensed professional. I am not an expert in any area of psychology. I am just a student who is expressing his views and is sharing what I know. I will be touching uh, sensitive topics such as drugs, mental disorders, death of infant babies. So be advised. So drugs, medication, and pills. I'm not gonna be pushing pills. I think we are an over-medicated society, but it is usually the people who don't need it that pop in like candy, and the people who don't think that, oh, that's for crazy people, and I'm not crazy. I think that's in a stigma that we need to move away from, and we need to understand that the brain is like any other organ in our body. It's just like your liver can fail, just like you can have a kidney failure, your digestive system can malfunction and you may probably need to take a medication for the rest of your life. I know somebody who needs to take gastritis medication every day due to the consequences of taking medication every single day. But it's not their fault. There's just a malfunction in their body. And this is the same thing with our brain. It isn't that you're crazy or you're insane. No, it's just that your brain is malfunctioning. And there's a solution for that. An upsetting fact that many people don't know is that the most likely people to commit suicide, the biggest group is the elderly, followed by adolescents and young adults. And it's saddening because I can guarantee you that about 90 to 95% of the time, that child or person have been on some sort of medication. And I'm not saying that you should pop a pill and be happy, but what I'm saying is that it will at least get you out of that suicidal stage and move you out to a place where hopefully you can help yourself. When you are so deep in depression, anxiety, or some sort of hallucination or whatever is happening, you can't even see the light at the end of the tunnel and medication isn't going to solve the problem, but help you bring, up, bring you up afloat so you can hopefully from there, you can pull yourself up and exercise and get counseling and do what you need to do. I would tell people, if you or a loved one is starting to have issues with mental health, you start with your regular old doctor or pediatrician. That's who you go to. They will then tell you how to navigate, where to go, if they need to refer you to a counselor or to a psychiatrist for medication or a clinical psychologist or something because living like that is not really ideal. Now, medication is not for everyone. I want to throw that out there. About 5 or 8% of the people who suffer from schizophrenia or depression will not respond to the medication. ADHD is a disorder that we use medication for and it works wonders for some, but for some, it doesn't. And the problem with these medications is that they are not like any other medications. In an antibiotic, a doctor will determine how much they will give you based on how much you weigh. Now, it's not really like that because you can have someone who is very big but requires a very small dose of a uh, narcotic and you can have someone who is very small who will require a very large dose. Which by the way, has very little to do with weight and mostly on how your brain processes. And we have so many medications because you can have schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, addictions, all of the above because of different neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are the little things in your body such as adrenaline, dopamine. Those are what we call neurotransmitters. And in each medication, it works for certain neurotransmitters or groups of them. But there isn't a test where I can just inject a needle through your brain, pull fluids and say, oh, you're short on dopamine here. This medication is going to work. No, it's going to be by trial and error, meaning that they have to find and prescribe you the right medication and the right dose for you. I know someone who started with their anxiety. They had to go to the doctor and they tried to treat it. They gave him an antidepressant. I think it was an effector. And so they went from literally worrying for everything to not caring about anything at all. There was no sense of urgency. There was no running late in the morning. They would not hurry up. Everything was going to be fine. Nothing going to happen. And they, were, and they realized that this is not normal. This is too much. And so they switched them to Paxil. That they remember because they didn't sleep for seven days straight. 
they would lay down and their brain would not turn off and he would sing a song and whatever but they weren't anxious though it's just that their brain wouldn't turn off and so that's when he finally told me and i said you know what you need to go to see a specialist man uh, i don't know what that doctor is doing time passes by and i get the news that they did end up seeing a specialist that grant unfortunately granted him the right medication and doses and ever since most of his days are just chill and calm he did told me that he got off of them once and in about a week or two they were like oh shit um that's where he realized that the medication was something that he has to live by for a long time and in most cases it is usually a genetic thing some disorders like depression or anxiety runs through families and so it will most probably be a rest of your life kind of thing sometimes and maybe just episodes for instance when my grandmother passed away god rest her soul i had an episode of depression i was sad i've never been depressed before i've never been depressed after it was just a coping with that situation for some people their disorders can worsen some people's anxiety can get more pronounced the older they get unfortunately that's how it is now the point i'm trying to get here is that i'm not saying you should get medication i'm saying don't close yourself off to it talk to your doctor it is an option and you don't have to live like that my psychology professor would have students come in and say that they are losing their mind and my professor would say no you're not losing your mind you just got a problem that can be treated one of her stories would involve a kid that came up to her at the last day of class towards the end of the semester. The kid says, ma'am, is it normal that I am hearing voices other than yours? She says, no, that's not normal. You're schizophrenic, probably, or having episodes of psychosis. Because mental illnesses start to show usually around late teens, early 20s. And I know there have been cases of schizophrenia and depression in children as young as preschool and toddlers. Although it's rare, but usually symptoms, onsets, and adolescence or early 20s. Why? Because you can either have the gene for it, or most commonly, stress. And where does life start to get real? In your teens and 20s, right? Although, I know for some people, life gets real in their 30s or when they become parents. Again, medication by itself is not gonna cut it. It will most of the time get you where you can help yourself. So keep that in mind. Now, what are the neurotransmitters that I am talking about? Well, we have to identify certain neurotransmitters that can affect our behaviors, moods, and mental processes. The first one is called acetylcholine. It's a neurotransmitter that your neurons release all day long, all night long, 24 hours a day. And acetylcholine does two things. It controls involuntary muscle movement and helps with memory. We think it's the glue that makes the memory stick. So acetylcholine, you have two kinds of muscles, involuntary and voluntary. Voluntary muscle movements are the muscles you can consciously move or want them to move like your hands, neck, arms, and legs. They should not be waving by themselves unless you want them to. And then involuntary are like the muscles like your heart that can pump all day long and you don't even have to think about it. And then your digestive system, your diaphragm, all of those are involuntary. Now, chemical biological warfare. You've heard of it. It affects acetylcholine, if you didn't know. In chemical warfare, they will make this chemical that resembles acetylcholine. They will put it in an airplane that they use to spray crops, and they will fly it over a city and spray it to the people that will then inhale it. It goes into your bloodstream, goes up into the brain, and blocks the receptors where acetylcholine should be going. And you basically stop breathing, because your body is not getting the command to breathe, your heart stops pumping, your nervous system becomes paralyzed and resulting in death. Venoms are like that too. There are two types of venoms. One will get you swollen, just like a bee stinging you, especially if you're allergic to them. Your esophagus or bronchial tubes will swell, making you unable to breathe. And then there's the nerve agent venoms that affect your acetylcholine. Uh, insects, animals like uh, the black widow or a king cobra, you may not realize it, you've been bit, but your nervous system will start getting paralyzed because of it. Now, with memory, people with Alzheimer's and dementia essentially suffer from neurons rapidly dying. The brain ages faster, so uh, as neurons start to die, you make less and less acetylcholine. So at first, they may forget short-term stuff like where the hell they left their keys, or if they ate today or not. 
cut that will still remember their grandfather from 1982 and still remember people's names. Then it gradually moves to long-term memory, such as names and dates, to then move on to muscle memory, like riding, walking, to ultimately not knowing how to breathe or not letting the involuntary muscles work, which leads to death. That sounds scary. I hope I die with my bed intact. Please God. Now, we can't cure Alzheimer's. What we do instead is we put synthetic acetylcholine to slow down the memory loss. But the specific cures for Alzheimer's, we don't have them. Then we have dopamine. We all love our dopamine. We love dopamine. We dopamine releases every time we are happy. We feel pleasure eating or we like something and it's really good and we enjoy it. And it is also responsible for voluntary movements. So acetylcholine is needed for involuntary muscles and dopamine is needed for voluntary muscles. So for people with Parkinson's disease, muscles that are supposed to move when you want them to move, start moving on their own. Arms and hands get shaky, your neck starts twitching. That shouldn't be happening. And we believe that it's because you are not making enough dopamine. And so dopamine, like medication, is used on patients with Parkinson's. Now, let me tell you something else. The reason why we call marijuana dope is because it is very similar to dopamine. That's why marijuana or cannabis oil is approved medically in most states to be used on Parkinson's. Schizophrenia, on the other hand, is too much dopamine. They are basically seeing things and you hear things because people are high on their own dopamine. This is why it is hard for schizophrenics to keep them on their medication sometimes because the antipsychotic medications are dopamine inhibitors. So the people who take them, they will tell you that they have no joy, they have no pleasure. Dopamine is also the culprit of making us addicted to things that should not be addicting. Food is not addictive by itself. You may say sugar is addictive, but not really. We like sugar, but you won't get addicted to it. You crave it, but you won't die without it. You know what I'm saying? Now, if your life is so empty and lame that the only happiness you have is from eating food, like for instance, your mom makes fried chicken every Tuesday and today is Tuesday, and the only thing you look forward to is eating fried chicken on Tuesday, it means that the only source of dopamine you're getting is by eating. So you may start to feel like you're addicted to food, when in reality you're just looking for your dopamine high. If your only pleasure comes from a certain person, then you're not necessarily addicted to that person. You're just looking for the dopamine high. And so that's a culprit for it. But it's not the only one. We have hormones and other neurotransmitters that play a role. And then we have norepinephrine, also most commonly known as adrenaline. Now, this is very similar to other stimulants, very similar to caffeine, cocaine, nicotine, and metaphetamine because it's, a, it's an upper. It is what sets up your fight or flight. It's, it's the one that you need in an emergency because it is the one that is going to accelerate your breathing. It's going to accelerate your heart rate. It's going to make you not be hungry. It's going to give you extra energy so you are more likely to survive. Too much or too little of this is associated with multiple disorders such as mood disorders, depression, bipolar disorders. And I'll tell you a funny story. So one of the big cities in Texas and the United States, that's um, specifically in San Antonio, um, they have some of these annual events called the Siesta Week. And one of the activities they make is the St. Mary Oyster Bake, which is kind of like a weekend on the St. Mary's College campus in San Antonio. So where they have live bands and beers and oysters and all of that. So during an oyster bake weekend, like about four or five in the morning, one of the boys dorms caught on fire. Probably a kid who fell asleep with a joint or a cigarette, but the dorm caught on fire. And then St. Mary was horrified because the media and firefighters and everyone was outside like around 4 or 30 in the morning. And you had these girls running out of the boys dorms where they shouldn't be. True story, by the way. Firefighters were running up and down the halls, knocking on doors, telling everyone they needed to evacuate. And there was this one guy in one of the dorms where firefighters passed by. They saw him and told him that he needed to get up. The building is on fire. And so they go at the end of the hallway. They come back just to still see him laying there. And now, I don't, I don't care how drunk or faded you are. If a firefighter tells you you get the fuck out of the building, 
the building is on fire, your flight or fight will kick in and everything goes down and you'll get up. Okay? But this guy wouldn't. It took three turns for the firefighters to finally lift him off the bed and telling him that the building is on fire. It took three turns for the firefighters to finally lift him off the bed and telling him that the building is on fire. The boy's response was that he would rather die than get up right now. Now that to me, that sounds like that kid had depression. Not enough, mm, like not enough, mm, you know what I'm saying? His norepinephrine wasn't kicking in and he had no motivation. Now, about one third of college students in America right now are estimated to be walking with depression. And a lot of people think depression is always sadness, which it isn't. And young people in particular, it may look like lack of motivation. Like they're just kind of tolerating existence and going with emotion without really having any goals. They don't look forward to anything. A lot of the time they look irritable and angry all the time and it could be just a norepinephrine issue. Then we have serotonin. Sleeping pills are in a category of their own. Serotonin is usually responsible when it comes to sleep problems. It is responsible for feeling emotions and your sleep-wake cycle. It has, a, it has a cousin hormone called melatonin that when put together, they regulate sleep-wake cycle. Serotonin deficiency, that is not enough serotonin, is associated with eating disorders, alcoholism, depression, aggression, and insomnia. If you have ever heard of sudden infant death syndrome, it is what the name implies. And it is the leading cause of deaths among infants in the United States. And the babies that are mostly high at risk are babies around the ages of two to four months old. Though it can happen anytime during the first year of life. And it is basically when you put a perfectly healthy baby to sleep and he wakes up dead. And we didn't really understand why. One of the studies they did on them was that they took uh, the brains of the babies and discovered that they generate more serotonin than normal which is why they sleep like 16 hours a day and as the brain develops it starts making less and less as they get older so not enough serotonin is associated with insomnia too much serotonin is associated with deep coma like sleeps so when they were conducting studies on babies that passed away by SIDS they were comparing to normal babies and found out that the brains of the babies that passed away we're generating eight times as much serotonin as a normal human being. And so they thought the reason they died was either because pillows or plushies were blocking their airways, they died because they couldn't move due to the deep sleep, or they quite literally died because the deep, deep sleep caused them to stop breathing. So one of the ways to decrease the chances of SIDS is to simply put the baby on their backs. Before the discovery, people would put the babies on their stomachs or side because they fear that if you put a baby on their back, they would spit upwards and vomit and start choking. It happens, but statistically, suffocation is most probable. Another thing that would prevent this is if you give them a pacifier. Now, a lot of people are against it. Research shows that it will mess up their gums and whatnot, but research also shows that it prevents suffocation. The explanation behind this is that when they are sucking on it and they are about to go to a deep sleep, their head will tilt and their muscles will go limb. So when the pacifier starts slipping out of their mouth, they will go like, will wake them up. So the pacifier prevents them from going into that deep, deep sleep where they could stop breathing or something. Also, you're not supposed to have a fan on top of them and not smoke in the household. That's common sense. Then we have gamma aminobutyric acid or GABA for short. It is completely the opposite of norepinephrine. It is produced when norepinephrine starts to worn off. GABA is what calms you down, although too much of it can cause depression. Not enough of it can cause anxiety. And the last one is the endorphins, which is your natural antidepressant. This is your feel good. This is why when people have any kind of mental health issue, we would always tell them they should exercise. Why should we exercise? Why do people tell us that? Well, because exercise releases endorphins. That's why when you finish working out, your mood feels better afterwards, you're more positive and you feel more alert. Another thing, endorphins also block the receptors for pain, which is why every time you work out, you don't feel a thing, apart from being tired. Also very similar to opioids. So that was all the neurotransmitters and how drugs and pills affect us. 
Special thanks to my professor and the Psychology 2E authors for the compiled research, collaborations, and slideshows. Please let me know if you like the TED Talk. I thought this video was fun. I love talking about topics like this one. And like the video for me and subscribe to the channel. Thank you for watching if you did watch it. And adios.